Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Roth, and uh, I am the director of the Raritan Image Center. On behalf of the REC, I want to thank you for joining us today for a conversation between artist Sunil Gupta and Mark Seeley of Autograph UK, curator of Sunil's wonderful retrospective exhibition, From Here to Eternity, which is now on view at the REC. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are broadcasting from Toronto Metropolitan University, which is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The university has recently acknowledged its role in the history of Canada's residential school system and changed the institution's name to redress that legacy in furtherance of truth and reconciliation. I'd like to mention a few program notes before we begin our Zoom today. Uh, we are recording today's talk and we will be uploading it onto YouTube uh, in the near future uh, to our channel for those who aren't able to attend right now or those who would like to watch it again. After the discussion, we will have a Q&A session and put your questions to Sunil and Mark. If you have a question at any point during the conversation, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen to submit the question for our consideration. We will not be able to get to all of them, but we will do our best in the time that we have today. And lastly, in the case of technical difficulties, we thank you for remaining patient with us while we correct the issue. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Sunil Gupta and Mark Seeley. Sunil was educated at the Royal College of Art in London, England, and received a PhD from the University of Westminster, England. Sunil uses photography as a critical practice focusing on race, migration, and queer issues. His work can be found in many private and public collections, including Tate Modern and Tate Britain in London, England, George Eastman Museum in Rochester in the United States, the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Photography in Japan, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the Royal Ontario Museum here in Toronto, Canada. Mark Seeley, OBE, is Executive Director of Autograph in London and Professor of Photography, Rights and Representation at University Arts London at the London College of Communication, which is affiliated with the Photography Archive and Research Center. Mark is interested in the relationship between art, photography, and social change, identity politics, race, and human rights. He has written extensively for many of the world's leading photographic journals, has written his own books, produced numerous artist publications, curated exhibitions, and commissioned photographs and filmmakers worldwide. Today, Sunil and Mark, who are longtime colleagues, will discuss their collaboration as artist and curator, respectively, to organize and contextualize Sunil's long and impactful career in photography for the exhibition and the accompanying publication, which I have here. Um, I'm holding this up because I want to encourage everyone to get your hands on this great book, if you can. It stands on its own as an inventive and fascinating exploration of Sunil's career. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that uh, we collaborated with this exhibition with our great partners at the Photographer's Gallery in London, and they presented it first. Um, and we are so pleased to now be able to present this exhibition uh, and Sunil's work to audiences here in Toronto. I also want to thank our sponsors, uh, the Canada Council for the Arts and Arts Council of England uh, for their generous support. Sunil's autobiographical narratives capture his experiences as a gay man of color living and traveling from his beginnings in Montreal, Canada, in the United States of America, in England, and in the country of his birth, India. Sunil and Mark will discuss for us how they selected the works included in the exhibition and book, both wonderfully titled From Here to Eternity, after one of Sunil's most interesting bodies of work to represent his groundbreaking and influential artistic practice from the 1970s to about 2010. Sunil, Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is yours. Oh, wow, Paul, thanks very much for such a generous uh, introduction. Um, I'll just let Sunil come through. Yeah, yeah, I mean, one of the things I just, just want to do a little, a little bit of formal um, uh, stuff if, if I can. It is always a pleasure to be in dialogue with um, with the Rick. It's always been such a in, incredibly um, wonderful and diligent and hospitable place to work with. This is the second project that we've done done together, and uh, I just want to say thank you to all the team 
at Rise and have always made me feel so so welcome and so receptive to 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 having ideas about what and how what, and the things that we can do in photography and with photography. So just a little bit of contextualizing stuff out out, out of having long conversations i think the original idea was to first stage this exhibition at ryerson because it made sense because of sunil's kind of background and, and the journey that had been in there was a certain um, idea that kind of floated around my mind knowing that there would be a kind of receptive space for him that it would be a kind of return not a return home as such because I think when there's such a kind of diasporic, multifaceted nature to an artist's work like Sunil, not a return home, but it's a kind of return to an important place of being, an important place of something starting. So the idea of um, having an exhibition in you know, Toronto with, with the Rick and such a, such a great place that could actually stage the work was, was pretty central you know, in, 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 in our mind. Of course, it was, it was if, we're going, if we're going to think about the idea of retrospective, there's always going to be something where some so there's always going to be a beginning point and I was always very very taken by Sunil's sense of honesty within the work right through to even today really this idea that there's a kind of a, a camera as a tool of investigation into the personal into the political and into I suppose the state of kind of consciousness of things that are not normally or have historically been ignored that includes things like queer life, that includes things like migrant experiences, that includes things like desire, that includes things like the idea of being able to put into kind of visual context the, the frames of our lives, the things that frame our lives, the things that we do see. So I wanted to kind of stay with this space of uh, inquiry and really, Sunil, just try and get a, give the audience a sense of where this this camera as a kind of radical eye that you have began. Okay. Uh, so uh, actually we just saw that body of work on the red walls. So that's where it began. Uh, the guy in Montreal where uh, I'd arrived from India two months after Stonewall to discover basically that my Indianness baggage, all that cultural information and ease was absolutely no use to me in a high school in Montreal. Very few of the kids knew where the country was, let alone much about it. On the other hand, a year later in college, I, I found a much more useful identity, this gay identity, something I didn't know existed before that came with a lot of early experiences around sex and sexuality from India, which is a whole other story to, to this new country, which seemed none of those things seemed possible. On the other hand, I think because of the beginning of Caleb and post Stonewall, I walked into a, a blossoming kind of gay liberation movement and uh, I grabbed hold of it with both hands, you know, Mark, because, uh, you know, the, uh, there were only two other Indians that I could see, and uh, that wasn't going to carry me very far. And this seemed much more interesting and cool. And as a young student, uh, I just sort of latched onto it. So really, my PhD was about this sense of uh, not leaving a homeland like India, but arriving into a, another place where being gay was possible in a way that it would never have been possible in the country that I'd left from, you know. So uh, I feel Canada gave me this amazing uh, experience that I'm still nostalgic about. It was a kind of innocent form of gay liberation. We had like some of the better things about it and none of some of not didn't have some of the really bad things like the Americans had. Uh, and so uh, I began to photograph uh, from inside our undergraduate gay liberation groups, etc. So for me, photography really started as a hobby that became an amateur documentary of uh, 
gay liberation politics. So for me, it was a documentation of the politics that I saw around me, which were the politics of uh, social politics, you know, demonstrating on the street or personal politics, the friendships and the networks that were evolving. And in a way, the alternative families that were evolving because people were coming out, yeah. people were having to step away from biological families who were not comfortable with their new position and they were having to find new people and new kinds of relationships really to, uh, for emotional support. And uh, I found myself in the, in, the, in the midst of it, yeah. Can we um, stay with the um, idea of family? Because it's interesting, isn't it? Because there's been, I mean, if the, 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 there have been other families built, but there is also the kind of, you know, the burden of biology, let's call it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm keen to kind of get a sense of um, mum and dad, you know, mum and dad yeah. and, and sister. And because you don't come alone, you come with. And it's, yeah. uh, it's not a kind of, it's not, it's not a young kid arriving in a new city. There's a kind of family, the family is there. And I remember my conversations with Penny were always very, very, very supportive of, of where you were, very proud and very kind of, uh, but very ambivalent as well, hoping that maybe some things would be on the, ch always optimistic for change to occur somewhere. <laughs> that there was a, oh, yeah. that there was a fad that was gonna be over one day, maybe. I'm just wondering how we could talk about the relationship, especially with your mum, especially with Penny, because she was very special. I think she never gave up hope that I would get married to a woman. And so <laughs> she would come to all the openings and look around the room and ask likely candidates, you know, like, why don't they marry me <laughs> uh, kind of thing. And so she startled several of my female friends by doing that. And she was serious, you know. <laughs> so at the same time, she was also like godmother to this huge queer family who would hang out at home and who she would feed and look after and all of that. I think the thing about uh, uh, Black or Indian culture, and I'm sure it's quite similar in parts of Africa, is that uh, our identities are familial. You know, they're tribal. What Indians understand and, and what Africans understand is the tribe. You know, it's in India, you call it caste, but that's what forms your identity. So the whole business of coming out, which was central and key to gay liberation, and declaring yourself this other identity, it just, I think my family didn't get it because they didn't think a sexual activity could lead to an identity, you know, that how could you replace tribe and, you know, and family with this, you know, yeah. with a sexual object choice, so to speak. I think, and I think that's, let, me, let me just pause there because I think that's a brilliant, a brilliant kind of way of thinking about it. How a, how a sexual how a sexual activity can lead to an identity that yeah. kind of, that formation is really quite profound isn't it in many ways it's like because you could actually say it's really quite radical it's like a kind of so what kind of moment how can how can sex become form that space of who you think you are does that alter anything yeah and it was the coming out about it you know i think that was the key issue for me and my dad, you know, who said to me, well, quite honestly, nobody cared about my sex life, which is probably true. And why did I have to keep telling everybody about it? They didn't really want to know, <laughs> you know, that nobody else did it, which was true. I mean, he himself and his generation practiced this. And, uh, you know, basically uh, you could do what you want as long as you, you followed the rules and the conventions of, marriage and children and so on so but to come out openly and say you're not going to and so do that and then come up with the whole critique of them you know the biological family yeah that's where the where the kind of issue was beginning to develop i began to appreciate this in much more and more in political terms so i got more and more radicalized around and it all led towards capitalism so Mark, for example, you have a wife, you have kids, you have a house, and you want to need a bigger house. The kids will grow up. They also need houses. You now need four cars instead of one. You know, it all like multiplies. Yeah. And to do that, you have to go out into the world and make ever more money and accumulate 
more and more this endless accumulation of wealth. I mean, that's that's been the, the bottom of the critique from the 1970s and how that plays out socially. And I think, yeah, I do think gay people were a threat to this because we were not conform, not just not conforming, but we were not settling into economic units. We weren't buying houses. We weren't multiplying. We didn't want to spend ever more money necessarily, you know, uh, like that. So. Uh, that's how I understood what game was, you know, uh, in those days. That's what I came to appreciate. Yeah. So by the yeah. time I came to London, it all got and bumped into the GLC. It got seriously radicalized and and found oh, a home in a left-leaning politics. Let's, let's let's not do London yet because we've got a bit of okay. a joke from <laughs> all get there. <laughs> so basically, Canada offers you a place to kind of like come out and be and feel confident and settled in the sense of you know, who you are, and that there was a pathway that was open. But then there's the kind of, um, then there's, I mean, and, and there's love as well. There's, there's relationships. There's, yeah. There's, there's, a, there, 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 there's, there's very special people that arrive. Um, and then, and then there's, then, and then there's the journey to New York, <clears throat> which I think kind of consolidates things in a sense with the camera as a point, you know, where, where desire might begin to live in other places. The kind of the, the streets, not the family. Things begin to feel as if they become quite expanded when you arrive in New, in, in New York. There's a, the, the, and also that the photographer, Sunil Gupta, the photographer kind of arrives in a, out of the hobbyist, this is me with my friends, but into a place which says, I'm beginning to learn to look. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I arrived in 76, it was uh, uh, very exciting for all kinds of reasons. Uh, you know, I was in New York, I, I was able to live in Manhattan, I lived on West 24th Street. Uh, everybody seemed to be gay, literally, or <laughs> there were all OAPs, you know, there were little old Irish ladies and gay men in my building, basically. And there were young Puerto Ricans who hung out and mugged everybody. And everyone thought I was a Puerto Rican and was going to mug them. So they would cross the street when they saw me coming along. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was uh, where I discovered photography in a frame on a wall. I'd never come across this. It certainly wasn't happening in Montreal when I was there. And obviously it was not happening in India when I grew up there. You know, I really didn't think I hadn't come across this idea that photography was something you put in a frame and on the wall. So that was a novel. And so I'd seen, I'd been teaching myself in Canada through books, but I'd never seen an actual print, if you see what I mean. So suddenly I'm in this city where there's the history of photography generally available to be seen in its original form in different museums. And there were a lot of galleries and there was all these shows and they encouraged you to hang out and chit chat. I met people on the scene. Uh, I dropped my MBA. I did classes in photography. It became more and more what I thought I wanted to do. And then I ended up uh, uh, being very influenced by my teachers. Then I had these two or three teachers, Lizette Modell and Philippe Holzman and George Tice at the new school who all said, thought I should, I should do it uh, and, you know, leave my business school, which I was, Could you which was a big moment for me. Sorry, Steele. Could you keep the um, slides in the, on the Christopher Street series for us, please? So there was tutors basically saying, "This is it. This is this is where you can where you can belong." If you pause there, that would be great. So tell us about what happened on Christopher Street, Sunil, because obviously this is. I was often I've often thought, is this an assignment? Is this a is this a stumbling over? It's a very particular. It's a it's a, number one. It's a beautiful series. Time sometimes does its work incredibly well. And when I first saw these, which wasn't that long ago, actually, only a few years ago, I just thought, what an incredible document. What a, what a wonderful return to the kind of uh, early work that I, that I knew you from, because we met, we met properly when, when you were with um, Network Photographers, a documentary agency. So we've known, I keep on winding back the clock when I think about our relationship, it keeps on going further and further back into all kinds of weird, weird spaces. But it, I just thought this was a kind of classic piece of kind of like voyeuristic 
pleasurable documentary uh, um, encounter. Some of this kind of this, some of this point of view, you and I have criticized publicly in the past as well <laughs> about <laughs> the, the aggressive nature of, of grabbing people in the street and stuff like that. But it, but it, but it, but it's obviously a moment of pure pleasure as well. Because what I enjoy about this series is that they, everybody seems to be very happy being being caught in this scopic regime of, 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 of promenading down Christopher Street. Absolutely, everybody was cruising, meaning they would, they would come out on the street to, to see and be seen. And that's what I was doing as well. And, uh, and I think uh, I was doing it, uh, I, I kind of arrived at Christopher Street from the bigger picture of the photography scene in which you know there was it was uh, we were all like super influenced by the new document show and so of course very aware of Beno Grand and Friedlander and that whole modernist tradition and of course I was being taught by it, Lisa who had taught Diane Arbus and so I was very familiar with this and so and I was living in this place New York and Manhattan which was actually the subject of modernist photography so all the pictures were about New York. So I was living in the place the pictures were about in every street corner, as many of us know, is so uniquely different in, in New York. And it's so kind of photographic and has a history of photography. It feels like it. So at first I was going street corner to street corner, uh, being where I was in kind of in the mid twenties on the West side. But every weekend I was down in the village, you know, doing what these guys are doing, cruising up and down the streets. And then I began to shoot them. And I feel like what I'm really doing with the camera here uh, is using it as a tool to, to try to uh, meet people. And uh, we, we are engaged in that same cruising. It's, it's the little looks people give and give the camera and so on. And, so uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm, I'm not a professional photographer who's arrived into somebody else's scene to take pictures of it for the New York Times. I am trying to photograph, my, it's like, this is my tribe. You know, I said us Indians, we, we need a tribe to belong to. I felt like this was, I'd found my people. These are my people. And so I just wanted to, also, it was, you know, part of the ethos of the time uh, was part of the rebellion was built on promiscuity. Yeah. And it was a time of, uh, you know, there were too many men and not enough time, actually. That was the problem. But <laughs> so with the camera, I could have, you know, a hundred people, you know, like over an afternoon. So it was much quicker doing it with the camera. And so that's what I was on about. And I think they recognized that uh, you know, if you stop and look at the way people are looking, there's a, sometimes it feels like they know what I'm up to also, you know. Uh, I find this very different to bumping into Paul Graham at the fridge in Brixton, two o'clock one morning, yes. when we've all got our shirts off. And I'm saying, Paul, you know, what are you doing? And he's saying, he's researching his next project. And I felt like saying, why don't you F off and research somewhere else? It was a break we have been here on our off duty time here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that sent that 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 idea that there was a I mean it is a kind of a, if we pause for a second on the slides, please. If there is a, that sense of uh, community around that and finding community and finding um, you know, that that place of comfort where you can actually just have the camera out and begin to work around you the way that if, the way you can with a family. And I think that's something that that, um, that, that carries through the work, that is part of the, you know, when we look across the arc of all of the work, next slide, please. When we look across the arc of all, all the work, it's really there in a kind of, um, what's the word? They are like, but they are like bonds, these works. They are like kind of visual kind of ties to a time and a place of being. They all offer, if you like, especially, you know, here in Exiles, they do offer a kind of degree of, What's the word? I suppose comfort and care within within within. It. If you pause there, please, that'd be great. If you if they 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 do offer a kind of a sense of comfort and care, and also a degree of kind of sensitivity of when to pull back 
when to step back and also when to actually step into the scene when the moments really can be you know comfortable and become sometimes overly familiar but mostly respectful in terms of where these relationships ships live and i know that exiles happened at a very particular juncture for you as well do you want to just unpack that a little bit please yeah this is now 86 87 i'm in london and uh, uh i'd been to india a few years earlier uh and casually explored photography of the gay scene it was impossible nobody wanted to be in the pictures so it was like a non-starter i just took a few pictures with people's heads missing then this opportunity arose it was uh, a commission from the same photographer's gallery and i thought okay i'm going to go back and do this properly but in the interim between 1980 and 1986 87 when i did the exiles a whole sea change had happened in terms of at least in britain of the appreciation of documentary photography so straight documentary photography was under a lot of critique uh, the idea that you fly into a third world country with your expensive camera shoot you know problematic stuff out there fly back to london and sell it to some agencies through other agencies like network was not on you know it was just it didn't feel right so uh I did initially kick off by doing some documentary pictures just to prove to myself that, yeah, I can, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, machismo involved, and you know, Mark, about that kind of photography. Yeah. You know, I can go to Africa, I can go to anywhere, I can take good pictures, you know, like that kind of thing. Very aggressive. So I, uh, yeah, so I hide in the bush, and the minute the guys are at it, I jump out, flash them, and I got pictures, right? But then I thought that was so unfair you know why publish pictures of people who don't want to be seen so all i wanted to do was to have pictures that uh showed us gay men doing what they do in the places that they do them and so i i i directed a kind of mise-en-scene so we kind of made a story i found a cast they were my informers and and then we went to the places where they met and where their cruising sites were they didn't have a singular christopher street they had this scattered parks and public spaces where they could meet and that was their community space that's where we went there were these private parties like this and those were the two kinds of spaces you could meet people and so i set up all the pictures to masquerade as if they were documentary pictures like this one here i mean flashed in a party but very much set up also these people knew they were being photographed and and were doing it for the picture so uh but, it, but so that was but my it, kind of departure from but it, but it also, stylistic. But Sunil also reminds me of um, just a quote, kind of um, Ariella Razule. There's an uh, this for me is like an early example of what she was calling for as a kind of civil contract within photography. That there was an there was an understanding that something was being made, that something was being shared, and something would have a life after that would serve a very particular purpose. So that's what I mean by, I mean, not a contract that's written through, not a contract that, that's a manifesto, but a contract in, in a certain sense of, 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 of identifying with you in that place. Oops, slides have gone. <laughs> of identifying with yeah. you in that place. So that, that's, that, that for me was very kind of, uh, very. It, it is still very interesting when we look back at the work, because I think what's happened for me, you know, cu curating across the work is that you, you know, sometimes when the making is happening, you kind of, you're in the, you're in the moment, things are fresh, things have been brought out, you see them. But this degree of what, what, I, what, I'm, what, what I'm, I guess I'm asking people to slow down a little bit now as I get older, is like, because if we slow down and reset and relook, and then we have this idea of a kind of, you know, a, a knowledge of reflection, we can see really how quite, how radical this this was really in in terms of in terms of this idea of a contracted space and how it was put because in, in the 80s documentary photography you know the magnum ethic the perpignan festivals the the uh, six day assignment sunday times was 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 really a, a massive market people were earning thousands of pounds for jumping out of bushes and taking photographs of people whether they were in war zones or social situations, yeah, you know? That's true. Yeah, we had a whole 
day of it a couple of weeks ago down at Martin Parr's foundation. Right. Of right. people talking about British documentary photography. It came out of that Sunday Times front cover moment. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, 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 and all those people like Barry Lewis and all that who were, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, quite at it we, on a weekly basis. So this then, I mean, and the text part of this really does become beyond the caption. It's not, it's not the golden rule of documentary, who, what, where, when, why. It's, you know, it's something else. <laughs> yeah, the text came about in a similar constructed way. So uh, I collected the audio separately and the text came from that. And so there was, it was not directly the same people talking. Uh, so, uh, and often uh, I felt a single picture sometimes doesn't really give you the whole complexity. You know, how was I going to put it over in a show in London, what it's like to be gay in Delhi, you know, just through a picture, you know, how would people, how would people even begin to read it? In fact, people didn't read it. People read, you know, there was zero response to this when it went up, uh, Mark, because it was, uh, people just thought, oh, color pictures of India and moved on. That was it. Yeah. It's like, it was a show about sexuality, but you know, if you weren't white in those days, in the 80s, you kind of, you had race, but you didn't have sexuality. Yes. It was strangely yeah. like we were sexless. We were just like these black and brown people. That was it, who had like all kinds of issues around economics and not being able to look after ourselves, who needed help. But we didn't seem to have love, fuller lives and loves and emotional and sex lives. So yeah, no one wanted to deal with that part. But yeah, it was almost as if um, that yeah. kind of homogenized that. Well, that's where the stereotype came in. You came, you came through into the in, into the space as a fully formed stereotype. That was it. You were in my inst in my case, it would be probably an, an aggressive black male. You know what I mean? Predat predatory and ready for an argument. And in your case, it would have been you know passive Indian gentleman. He must need something. You know so yeah. You weren't allowed to be, you know, the, 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 the multiple selves. But also theoretically, there was a lot of reading going on at this time. There was a yeah. lot of, you know, the, the postmodern theoretical work was underpinning the, uh, the, the, the um, you know, the practice because there was also a lot of artists who were beginning to struggle with the, doc, you know, especially those that wanted to be critical, the kind of feminist movement, the black art movement, you know, those that were beginning to look at class. I'm thinking Joe Spence. I'm thinking Mary Kelly, I'm thinking Victor Bergen, I'm thinking, you know, like artists that were out there who were really beginning to be engaged with as well. I'm thinking, you know, um, you know, courses that were offering radical literature about semiotics. I'm thinking about the rise of, uh, you know, Stuart Hall's work through the uh, um, Center for Cultural Studies. I'm thinking that there were, there were, there was, there were, there were texts that we were beginning to grab hold of especially in the late 80s towards the 90s and use these theoretical tools which were not just about trying to do things visually because it, it was about the positionality through these theoretical um, left-wing new ideologies that were being really embraced by what we were where we were essentially on the left. Yeah and there was of course post-colonialism yeah and so we were really we were reading Homi Baba and Gayatri Spivak and people like that, and who all happened to be Indian. So that was quite interesting. We had a lot to say, uh, even though they were at Columbia and not in India or in London for that matter. So it was a very much that kind of uh, post-colonial moment. And it's so weird today, if I can just jump to now, that the England that we live in wants to go back to 1945. Yeah. Unbelievable. You know, all that flag waving and let's go back to when they were great. I mean, honestly, what are they talking about? Yeah. Anyway, so. <laughs> uh, this... So the, the, the Black Experience Project is, an, is a kind of interesting moment as well, because there's a kind of sense where through documentary narratives, we're going to try and unpack the, the idea of what is this Black experience in Britain? I mean, again, quite, 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 I mean, for the mid 80s early 90s it's quite a radical thing to say the black experience you know let's 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 put it out there let's try and have a conversation with what what, what we're doing of course as well that this is you know britain that's in a kind of post-riot hangover 
that's fundamentally wrapped up in a in a Thatcherite kind of uh, a in a Thatcherite scenario. It's also a situation where the Greater London Council on the left bank, the, which is running the Republic of London, which has got all these naughty, all these naughty Negroes and these you know angry Asians and these queer folk and these feminists and these squatters. You know, a London that has absolutely got this sense of mobility in it. You could move in London, right? You could live in London. You could you could come to London and you could be free. And then there was money. From, there was some degree of cash to support these uh, these radical artists. There were studios to be had. There, there was something in the there was something in the poverty of the, and the class conflict that, that enabled a form of social mobility to happen. Yes, it was possible to live on, on not very much. It was possible to survive without having a full-time job. You could live in a squat, you could sign on. We, of course, we have the NHS. London is also uh, has an outpouring of art graduates, remember? So there's this huge number of people who come out with all kinds of training of some kind or another. And we were a generation you know, who had MAs in art. It was unheard of, you know, like, and so everybody was, charged, fired up with this, uh, with the theory, with the knowledge, and wanted to make some kind of practice. Uh, it was very urban and yeah, and it was kind of possible. And uh, our government recognized this and they started by shutting down, first of all, the main funders, the GLC. Yeah. Then they had clause 28, so they went for the homosexuals. Yeah. Uh, clause 28, by the way, was only repealed very recently. People forget how, homophobic the United Kingdom is. I was shocked when I arrived here how, how it was. There were so many arrests here, it was insane. But Clause 28 made it impossible to function uh, uh, in the mid to late 80s. Uh, in 86, we did the LGBT show at Camera Work. Well, same difference. Part of it was a secondary school workshop where kids just made photo stories about coming out in their high schools. And with Clause 28, we couldn't put it up. It was insane. Uh, and uh, we're coming full circle. Now we're hearing all of this again. You know, there's, uh, there's the latest attempts to, to muzzle this, what's happening in the schools. So, yeah. so there was this, these orders passed that LGBT stuff should be taught in the schools, but now there's this pushback, you know, and uh, and then if you look at the Americans, there's a heck of a huge pushback. So uh, it's all under threat again. Do we want to talk about the, because I think it's really important to, so we, the, there is the London, London is a liberatory place. I mean, I, I think London is, cons, as, I, as I look at the work, there's a certain sense of a political maturity that happens in London. There's a certain sense that, you know, this, it's not just about finding your your photographic voice but it's also about finding the political grounding for that voice to happen in and that this this uh identity formation through black consciousness through encounters with people like monica baker through yeah. encounters with people like rotomi funny Kiori, through long-term relationships with people like joy gregory through this sense that there is a community of others coming into the space that we could begin to, you know, not join forces because it's not exactly like an army as such, but think about collective spaces of being. Yeah, no, I think there was a generation of people who were like A, uh, trained, B, quite idealist. They hadn't gone to school to make money. And by the later, by the time we were working in our early years in the late, later eighties, people were also trying to live their lives in some kind of idealistic way, you know, not get a corporate job, not go and work for the times. You know, I, I didn't cross the, the picket lines when the big strikes happened and then Rupert Murdoch moved the printing press to Wapping and I lost a whole bunch of clients. But, you know, Barry Lewis crossed the picket line happily, yeah. carried on work. You know, but so you, you made those political choices and then you faced the consequences of it. But I think as a loose group of people in South London, I'm the South London, it was, it seemed like the normative thing to do. And, uh, and so people, uh, well, well, Brixton, yeah, I, I think what changed later is uh, people got very burned out. 
people began to die yeah. uh, around me. Tessa Buffen died, Rotimi Fani Coyote died. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and then uh, suddenly within 10 more years and then everything became about money. Yeah. And then yeah. a whole bunch of us from that time, you know, the Monica Bakers and the Joys and me and all suddenly thought, we forgot to make any money. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. that's what happened. <laughs> Join the gang. <laughs> forgot to pay the pension fund. <laughs> exactly. All of a sudden you hear, you hear a war. But let's come yeah. I mean, London, London also enables a certain degree of, I mean, there is some funding around. There is the Arts Council and yeah. there is some. You could make a few things. Yeah, you that's could, true. You, you could make, but, you know, there was, there lots was of these. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to say a lot of the work that we're talking about, you know, 10 years on, pretended families and stuff, I was just making, like my other people around me, we, we were just making work. It wasn't commissioned. It wasn't paid for. Nobody was buying it. We were just yeah. making it. I yeah. mean, were we stupid or what? We were just making things that nobody, that we knew that we were not in the commodity market. But this is one of the things that I say to younger artists as well. It's important. I mean, one of the things I say about Autograph too is that it's a, it's a making organization. Essentially, it's a space where we try and help people make things. We're not competing with for an audience. We're not competing with, you know, the Chisholm Hale or the Whitechapel. Autograph's DNA has been about actually just supporting people to try and make things, to have a voice, to amplify those voices and to put those voices into the center stage is to advocate for these different multiple voices that we want to have. But I also want to, I also want, because I'm very aware of time already, I also want to um, talk about uh, going, being in London and then going to India again is a kind of different Indian, right? Yeah. A different, and reconciling this idea of homelands and who you are and, the passing of the father and the responsibility and then the kind of activism around the kind of you know mobilizing people around hiv activism you know i think there's a there's a massive moment there and which leads to a a, a huge political kind of change in the government of india so it's an amazing story that 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 place through photography really uh, no it's true i was very fortunate I moved back to India at uh, just the right time, in a sense. Uh, both photography and gay rights needed work doing, and I got involved with it. I, for both of those things brought them together. We started having a queer festival, which had a photography show at the center of it. And India went from um, being a country that had no gay photography at all to a country that now has at least over 600 gay photographs as an archive wow. that you can go and research now if you wanted to because we instigated them you know and all that kind of grassrootsy organizing that i learned from the jlc i put into play over there and of course as a society and, with, and other indian activists who were they successfully got a, a legal case through the indian system to legalize gay sex and then in this absurd way it got reversed four years later and then finally in 2018 it got re-reversed and now it's back to being legal which is quite extraordinary for an asian country of that size to have legalized it nobody else has it's incredible i've just done a project in birmingham about lgbt refugees in the uk and they come from all the neighboring countries pakistan bangladesh even from russia and of course, any number of African countries where the situation is really horrific. Yeah, I think people lose um, lose sight of just how how aggressive and how violent the state is globally. Or can be, you know, and I think yeah. the Indians are really lucky that they've managed to quietly, in a way, overturn this without hundreds of arrests, without torture, without, you know, systemic rape and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah it's incredible. Well, look, Sunil, I think um, okay. we're in a place where we have to wrap up in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. But I do want the, the, I do want just to very quickly address the, the Here to Eternity uh, uh, project, because that was also a very particular juncture in the making of where you were. And almost in a kind of funny, tragic way, a kind of a new formation of a space of being. And again, through the camera and through photography, helping you realize 
the potential of or, or remember or remind you of what you essentially were, which is an image maker that describes these uh, that describes the personal through this through the access of the lens. And I just want to just quickly go over what the Here to Eternity uh, project as a as a commission was about. Oh, so uh, I'd been diagnosed HIV in 95, and then I decided to not make work about it simply because I felt, you know, the, with the gay and the black and the Asian, I'd like way too much baggage already. And if I added HIV and AIDS to it, I'd be completely isolated in the corner. So I tried to stay away from it. And, and then my own personal life took a turn for the worse after my diagnosis. Uh, and yeah, I, I wasn't well and I was freelance and so I was making any money as already mentioned. And then by 99, everything was looking very not so great. And then along comes Mark Seely and autographs and you said, would I do, you know, did I want to do something if you gave me some money to commission something? And so I, uh, I used that to uh, A, go back to the dark room because I'd been doing digital for the previous 10 years which is again, it's very physically draining, I find. It's very not uplifting. Uh, analog darkroom experiences are much more uh, positive. Uh, and so, and I made this body of work, which was these diptychs on the left, you see me through various aspects of my illness. And on the right were my local gay bars in South London, which had one by one transformed themselves into sex clubs. Uh, uh, which was quite extraordinary, and that the whole other history and quite a different reaction to HIV compared to North America, where everything was shutting down. Here we were expanding it, <coughs> and it was like a metaphor. I shot them in the day, and they're closed, and so it's a little bit of uncertainty whether you're locked in or out of these sex clubs. But uh, basically, um, yeah, autograph, Mark Seely, you've given me, you kind of gave me a <laughs> chance and it led to another much bigger project which lasted for three years and took me back to India, looking at HIV in India. And then from then on, uh, things just expanded. And here we are today. No, and I think it's, uh, I think time, time is a bandit, as we well know. Every time I look in the mirror, I think, oh my God, um, what ha whatever happened to the day. So I think we're going to try now and maybe just, open up, there's, there's, there are, for those that are local to Toronto or nearby, there are several episodes within within the work, within Sunil's retrospective here, that we have not had time to discuss, which deal with the history of art, you know, the history of portraiture, the personal, the political, and I think we're gonna have to just see if we can spend a little bit of time to open it up for people and have some questions. Sunil, thanks for that. That's just sure. an ongoing an ongoing conversation. <laughs> yeah <laughs> great i think paul is going to uh, questions if i'm right uh thank you guys uh, so much that was fantastic um so interesting and uh i'm very sympathetic with what mark just said there's so much to talk about um that uh i feel like i could listen to you for another hour um but we did get some good questions so some more things will emerge from that um i want to thank uh, members of, uh, of our audience for uh, submitting their questions. And anyone who still has a question, uh, please feel free to, uh, to uh, put it through our Q&A portal. Uh, the first question, uh, Sunil, um, uh, addresses something that you brought up uh, early, uh, uh, early in our uh, conversation. Um, and uh, it reminded somebody uh, that they had recently read a, a quotation of you or something from an interview where you spoke about how being queer didn't have to do with whom you were having sex with, uh, but rather how you didn't fit in with heteronormative society. And, uh, and I know Mark touched on this a bit earlier, but this person is wondering if you can expand on it. Uh, he or she notes that um, it's really interesting uh, to hear that in talking about your identity and your origins and uh, uh, coming out to your parents that they didn't understand why you needed to, uh, to be public about your identity. And of course, uh, with um, your work as an artist, uh, you've been doing this um, throughout your career. So this person wants to know with photography, 
uh, there is a sense that the lens can be a tool to stand between yourself and a subject. Um, and how you use that tool uh, can be very different from photographer to photographer. Can you talk about your own experience uh, of how being the photographer as opposed to being the subject um, contributed to your development uh, uh, as a queer person, to your own understanding of your identity as a queer person of color, trying to find your place in uh, the communities that you exist within? Okay, so was that two questions in one? Because it was the first half about... It was all context. Anybody can read. Yeah. It's all context so, that key question oh, okay. is about how photography um, and okay. being a photographer changed your identity as a, a queer person of color. Well, uh, basically, yeah. Uh, through photography, I found a public forum to be very open and to be able to discuss issues that are pertinent to me very personally, but which I can bring out into the public sphere. And that's been a very liberating and positive experience to me. Uh, you know, when I go on dating sites and because of my age and who I am sometimes, uh, and people who don't know my work that, but uh, who just see, you know, my, this is especially in places like India, people offered to blackmail me, you know, that they were gonna out me if I didn't give them money. <laughs> I'm not joking, this is what people do <laughs> on dating sites. <laughs> so that kind of thing. So, I mean, so once you've announced, so the announcing, it's been very, it's cleared the deck of all of that nonsense. And also same with HIV. So with that show mark, uh, by putting my naked body out there, actually I did have a moment of doubt just before we let the people into the room that I'm very exposed now. Like I'm just stood there naked saying, hello, this is all HIV positive. At a time when there was so much stigma about it. But once we crossed the threshold, there was no turning back and it's given me the strength to like, be more and more open about it and to talk to many other people about it. So I think photography to me has been a fantastic tool to, uh, to talk about uh, issues, both personal and political, and, uh, and to talk about, uh, you know, difficult things that people don't like talking about, which is that we had a gay liberation movement, which was entirely white. If you look at the history of it, it seems like blacks and Asians weren't there. And so uh, there's that sort of work to be done. Uh, so what I'm basically, uh, yeah, it's in a nutshell. Of, I don't know what I would have done without photography. Uh, I would probably have been uh, a banker married and had some sex on the side. But I probably had a lot more money though. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> I don't think it's about, I don't, but it's not just about the photography as well, because when we did the book, what became very clear, it's about the community in that space. Because what's interesting when we go through, the, I mean, this is a book about photography that's not about photography, it's about a life in photography. And it's a life, and it's a life about the ephemera, the things that we collect as we move through the relationships, the invite cards, the places that we attend, the parties, the family, the demonstrations, the, you know, the, 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 the relationships, the conferences, the kinds of encounters that we have. And I think, I think the radical term that we tried to have with, with a book rather than making a monograph was to kind of make a kind of monograph about the relationships that are, that are at play. The photography is absolutely critical in, um, being a curator here, so forgive me. The photography has been, is, is absolutely critical, I think, in that sense that it just provides a space for the conversation, right? And I think that that's maybe what we, sh what we share. I've, I've never really, really imagined myself as a kind of, you know, curator, historian, but there are alternative ways of thinking how histories and stories come into play. And I think if you hadn't collected these kind of dialogues in these spaces and if photography hadn't allowed and if your work in photography hadn't allowed, you know, things like collectives and spaces to emerge, then they're absent, they're missing. 
and they become they become you know they, they become memory or metaphor or something else. But it, what's great about the uh, the display of the ephemera as you get to the show, it shows categorically that there's things that are happening outside the frame that are really important, really important. And you know, and I think that's what I what I what I think about the 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 kind of ton tonalities of the work. A really broad range. If you know, if it's music, it's a really broad symphony of conversations that are in, truly intersectional. And of course, the queer activity through that is a major kind of you know holding base. But it's not the only one because there is mum, there is dad, there is family, there is travel, there is love, there is desire. There is openness, there is illness, there is society, there is poverty, and there is underneath it all, actually, a wealth of generosity. And that's great the way that you shared that through the camera. I have to say that for me, that was um, such a revelation to hear you first describe that to us, Mark, when you approached us about doing the exhibition. Um, I think that you knew you were speaking to a photography minded person while you were talking to me and you wanted to explain why this or how you were going to approach Sunil's work, the organization of it, um, the creation of a retrospective as, uh, I mean, maybe most people don't know this, but it's one of the hardest things that a curator can do. And it's also very difficult for an artist. And when you said to me that you wanted to show Sunil's work as a life lived through photography, um, encompassing everything, including, yeah. including uh, um, you know, the, the, political ways that you looked uh, looked at the world, um, but not exclusively that. Um, photography is a mechanism for living and that you wanted the audience to understand that about Sunil and to see his life. Yeah. Um, that was fascinating to me and it immediately told us that we would, this would be a very different exhibition um, than uh, had it been done by another curator. And also that this would be a truer exhibition of Sunil's work. Um, and it's why we said yes immediately. Um, and why we're uh, so grateful for being able to do this exhibition because it's quite innovative and the book is the same um, in many ways even more innovative uh, so I do encourage people to uh, to look at that uh, we did receive a question um, uh, from someone who wants to know Sunil do you have any suggestions for documenting queer women in their authentic environment in a way that doesn't lend itself to the male gaze or fetishization Okay, uh, that's a slightly curious question because it's talking about gender in a way that people are not talking about gender so much these days. Uh, because what's male and what's female is, you know, uh, is up, is under great discussion. Uh, I mean, if I look back historically, I can say that the 80s were very polarized gender-wise. Uh, so women did women's things and women did some kind of, did a kind of feminist photography and uh, blacks did black things and gay men like me did gay things and then straight men did everything because they were universal. And that was, uh, but then, so of course the uh, overarching, Historical gaze, let's put it that way. I don't want, which is a male gaze. That is true. And so one of the huge problematics that we have to overcome historically and are events like the British, the big British photography show at MoMA, if anybody will remember back in the, was it the 80s? I can't remember the exact year, was six white men, Chris Killip, Martin Parr, it's like women didn't exist. You know, there's hundreds of British women who take pictures, but the curators seem to have missed them. So I think there's a kind of been a, a historical male case in the modernist tradition of aestheticizing something. But for me, on the other hand, I, I learned photography with Lisette, who was a woman who was a modernist. And my teacher had found him was a German woman who was an incredible modernist. So I think, but they, fewer of those voices. Uh, and so coming back to queer women being photographed through a male gaze. Now I'm thinking I have a number of uh, queer women friends who have adopted male pronouns. 
Now, would they work with a male gaze? That's the question I want to ask this person back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, there's, a re there's a refreshing sense of today. I think there's a refreshing sense of fluidity around now. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things about yeah. Uh, I think one, one one of the things that one of the things about the eighties is that um, well, there's a refreshing sense of fluidity around, but there's a dangerous sense of political silos as well occurring, like us and them. You know, you there, we there. So there's this, and I think you know Brexit for us leaving Europe is 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 is, is is leaning on this, as Sunil mentioned earlier, is leaning on this sense of uh, a bit like Trump, let's let's make Britain great again, Camister, which means that all kinds of outmoded traditional um, roles are being held up as the way we should be. But there's a there's a generation of complete pushback against that. So this, I'm enjoying watching just how fluid things are. Even the kids coming home from school are. You know, having these conversations is ten and twelve of us. It's like what I do. I can't keep up with uh, with with, the, with you know with with the change, and that's really refreshing that they can play play with that with that identity. You know, um, a, a formation, especially around their sexuality, and that's liberating. Even that that's a massive move, really. So the male gaze is there. There, there there's a, I think that it's it's that that traditional reset button is there. It's a bit like a warm cup of tea at three o'clock. Well, really, really, most of the nation is actually drinking coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, uh, dovetailing perfectly with that, we received a question from a a young photographer. Uh, an emerging photographer who is Indian Canadian, uh, and um, and who is at, in this moment uh, managing a identity and building a community, uh, juggling between two countries uh, and um, and different heritages. And this person wants to know, Sunil, what would you say uh, to this emerging photographer? Do you have any tips or learning or advice that you would give to this person uh, in embarking on their approach? Uh, to documenting their lives and connecting to their communities. Oh yeah, my advice is always to young people that they should make work that they want to make. They shouldn't make work that they think curators want to see or galleries want to see or magazines want to see. They should make what they want to make. And, uh, and so there's a kind of certain, I think the best we can hope for from someone that there's a certain truth in their work, in their output, and that it's not being done for some kind of reason uh, uh, for the third party. You know, uh, fashions come and go. You yeah. don't want to follow today's fashion for the sake of it. It'll be out of fashion in a few years. So yeah, you've got to do what's coming from within. Mm. Wonderful. Uh, and just one final question uh, before we go. Uh, someone has written in to ask that now with the ubiquity of, uh, of uh, cameras on telephones, uh, everyone having uh, one of these, uh, do you think that that has actually paradoxically created a loss of the, of the kinds of spaces necessary to share conceptual narrative photography um, and to get uh, an adequate amount of attraction uh, and interest for projects like yours and for investigations, investigations like yours? Or do you think that these phones free us all up? Um, what is your perspective on that? Oh, I have a, well, I think it's not either or, I think it's an add-on. So I have, I have one too. This one takes 27 megabyte raw files. So it's as good as my Nikon. Uh, so basically, I don't see why it should be one thing or the other. And I think was, uh, for example, in my work, we were just talking about there's this, the proper work, uh, which was all done in maybe dark rooms. And then there was all this other work documenting all the parties and the going out and all this informal photography. I think it's kind of all come together. And I think what we're seeing with our younger generation is that they're learning, a new kind of photography, the digital one, and they're editing on phones and they, a lot of it's now video actually, and the output, and they're doing very clever things that I couldn't even begin to do, you know, so, but I think uh, this idea that 
proper serious photography belongs to somebody with a 10 by 8 analog camera, you know, who's trying to be Alex Sof. I said, no, you know, that's really ridiculous. You know, I, people are using what's most familiar and what makes the most sense. And people live in a digital world. I teach classes to kids who live entirely on their screens. I can, you know, for me to stand and lecture them is analog. And 19, you know, they think, it's really old hat. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think it's an it's an additional technology, and it's uh, equally serious. And um, there's no right or wrong way about it, though. I'm not trying to suggest that there's a proper way to use your phone and a bad way to use it. Uh, and you can hold on to your ten by eight color negatives if you want but they don't by their presence make you some kind of better photographer i mean so you know if you had a lot of money you could be edward botinsky but hey you could also do it with a phone mm. uh, so yeah i'm also do diy a lot of photography what appeals to me photography is that it's very diy it's all about a single person going out and doing what they can with but the tools that they have, it was ridiculous that this professional equipment cost thousands of pounds. I mean, you know, I could never, I've never been able to buy a house of that camera. It cost 20,000 pounds. <laughs> you know, that's more money than I'd ever see. I've never seen that kind of money together in one place. So, except once when I had to buy a flat, but that was it for which I paid for for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, whatever's handy, you know, uh, I use digital. I mean, I did two commissions lately, all digital. You know, who's going to want to wait to see that? I went all the way to Birmingham, got half an hour with somebody. I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't afford to for, for some film lab to not have processed the film, some sort of mess up like that. I, it's too convenient. I'm all for digital. Hmm. I'm for both. <laughs> I love both. I want to hustle blood. <laughs> I know we had that gone, it's gone, Mark. I saw yeah, I know. I, know. I, need, I need a ball one. <laughs> I, I think I, I just want to add to that. I think it's I, I don't I love analog. I just love the idea of it. Um I'm as I said before, I'm I'm really loving the slowness of it all. The, the officially is I think there's something about both there's something magical about it all. I think I do agree that it is an add-on. I don't think we should do do, do 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 either or. And I think some of the most beautiful images were taken on a simple little ten by eight, mm. and that's that that's that's the way it is. If we think of people like Roy de Carava and others as well. I mean, you know, even Golden Parks, they're all thirty-five millimeter things. It's a, it's a it's a beautiful medium. It's evolving and it's quick. And the more people that have got it, hopefully, the more democratic it will all become. What do we do? My question back to that person is what do we do with all these images, right? <laughs> Where are they all going to go? I think Suli Rulik talks about an image sphere that the world is covered now in, in, in a complete wave of image, images circulating the world as we speak. Sunil and I are sending images to each other all the time at night, emails, whatever. Even last night, at 11 o'clock at night, we were sourcing a photograph. <laughs> from somewhere so it's the, the, the images and we could never have done that with analog so that they're, they're, they're the beautiful things mm, wonderful thank you both for uh, continuing your uh your long conversation uh, with us today and letting us in on about an hour plus of it uh it's been wonderful uh, i want to thank both of you uh i know you're on uh on london time um so thank you for making time for our audiences here uh and thank you everybody for tuning in um uh, it's been terrific. Uh, please do look for Sunil's book. Uh, follow Sunil as he does ever more projects, always working on something new. Um, <laughs> thank you both. Uh, oh, can I just very quickly just say really sincerely thanks to all the all the team at Ryerson, all oh, yeah. the team working on, on, on the project. Also a big thanks to you know the Bagri Foundation who helped with the with the project and the funding of the book as well. Also, of course, the great team at the Photographers Gallery for just bringing it all together. And a lot of this, just to remind people that a lot of this conversation happened during lockdown as well. There were very difficult times for all kinds of reasons to, to think through. And in the work, I think, that Sunil has produced and doing this retrospective during this pandemic just showed us how urgent it is and how pressing it is that this medium of photography allows us to have these 
incredible conversations across time and space. So thank you everyone who has allowed us to have this opportunity to have this work in, in, in the public realm. And thank you, Sunil. Yeah, thanks everybody. And thanks so much everybody at Ryerson for the great show that I finally got to see last month. It looks like amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.